Charlie Wilson to stop with it. Morning, Garland, Nixon, and Scott Ritter, and we got one or two things to talk about today. Let's talk. All right, Garland and Scott Ritter. You know, before we, there's the, the, the something at the top of my mind that you would be the guy to talk about this, and that is, uh, let's get straight to it. Middle East. Oh, before we do, everybody, everyone, don't forget, scottritterextra.com is Scott's website. So all of Scott's good works, you can find at scottritterextra.com. And don't forget, um, Scott's, you know, like everyone else, he's got a He's got to feed the family. He's got dogs running around there. The dogs are hungry. Everybody's hungry. When you go to scottritterextra.com, uh, make sure that you... Um, you support Scott uh, financially and uh, help keep, help him um, help him do his good works. And of course, scrolling across the bottom, you see PayPal, buy me a coffee, all that stuff. So help the channel any way you can, if you can afford it. Um, make sure you share this on all your social media platforms and all of Scott's good work. Okay, Scott, let's get right to it. The discussion in the Middle East is about uh, numerous, numerous things, but the one that I want to get your expertise on is... The discussion of Israel going into Gaza, of Israel IDF soldiers, which I've been reading a lot. It seems like they got a lot of people who are, you know, I'm not using this in a derogatory term, weekend warriors. They got a lot of people who are, you know, working in their normal job. Then they get called up. Boom. They've got some level of training. I cannot imagine going into a very, very densely built up and populated urban area to fight people who are waiting for you, it's going to turn out well for anybody. Uh, your thoughts on the subject of a potential in Israeli physical invasion, guys on foot going into Gaza for a fight and what that means. And do you think it's going to happen? Well, first of all, let's, let's just talk about the, the fight itself. Um, we're talking about urban warfare in a densely uh, populated, even if they depopulate it, uh, it densely, um, it's densely populated with structures. Uh, many of these structures will have been destroyed, uh, which means now you've made movement through this area even more complicated for the Israelis. Um, the Hamas has planned this operation to a T. Um, Please, people, don't disrespect Hamas's professionalism. You can sit there and call them a terrorist organization. You can accuse them of every crime ever done to humanity. Uh, some of your accusations are probably true. Um, I'm not here to, you know, con, you know, to embrace Hamas and sing their praises, but I respect the fact that these guys carried out one of the more professional military operations in modern history. Uh, this surprise attack against an Israeli military that was supposed to be impervious to surprise attack. I mean, they built this system to avoid just what happened. They have a wall uh, put up full of technology designed to prevent tunneling from underneath. Uh, they have sensors, they have cameras, they you know, motion detectors, the whole thing. They have automated cannons so that if something happens, the alarm goes off, the lights come on, the cannon automatically orients, and then some dude sitting in a in a room far removed with a mouse points and clicks and kills everything. Um, it, it, this wasn't supposed to happen, but Hamas did it. They did it by identifying every aspect of the Israeli position and coming up with a solution to it. If you have surveillance cameras, um, build a drone, fly the drone into the camera, blow it up. If you have cannons mounted, blow them up. Um, you know, identify the breach in the wall, come through the wall, assault through the position by knocking off communication so they can't communicate to others. Uh, pick a day when everybody is on holiday. Um, you know, they had maps exactly where he wanted to go, that, you know, aerial maps. So they've been flying drones over Israel, snap, taking happy snaps. They had the maps. They had the intelligence. They had everything labeled where it wanted, where the officers lived, where the prime targets lived. They knew where all the secret military installations were, um, you know, the, the intelligence buildings, et cetera. They did this attack. They're very good, which means that they 
have planned the whole thing. Remember, they snatched over 200 hostages, brought them back, and integrated them into their system, their network. Um, why? Because they want Israel to attack. They want Israel to come into Gaza. This isn't a case of Hamas saying, oh, no, 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 please don't come. Please don't come. Understand they had a meeting with the Iranians in Qatar, the political wing, and the Iranians were like, hey, we can we can come in if you need us. And Hamas was like, no, nah, boss, we got this. We, uh, we're good. We, we got this all under control. And they do. They want Israel to come in because they have prepared the ambushes of ambushes. Uh, when Israel comes in, they will be hit with, you know, uh, improvised explosive devices, except these aren't improvised. They're deliberate. They've been designed for what they want to accomplish. Every square meter as Israel advances, things are going to go boom. Israelis are going to die. Israelis are going to get wounded. They're going to come in to evacuate the wounded. While they're evacuating the wounded, Hamas is going to come up through a tunnel behind them, slaughter them, grab more prisoners, go back down underground, blow that tunnel so Israel can't uh, pursue, go into a, a different tunnel network altogether and repeat and rinse, rinse and repeat. And it's going to happen. And Israel is going to just get slaughtered, trying to move into an ambush that evolves as they come in. Now, can Israel win this? It's a tough, it's a tough thing. You'd need highly professional troops, people that have been training to do this, meaning that as you advance forward, you have people behind you on watch, looking for the people popping up. Uh, you've coordinated, you've spaced it, you've gone in with technology, uh, the bulldozers to clear the way, you're doing micklicks, you're, you're firing your explosive charges to blow up uh, devices, you're going in with ground penetrating radar, looking for the tunnels to advance. It takes a lot of coordination, a lot of, um, a lot of training, a lot of preparation. The military that Israel has assembled here isn't that military. They have one or two brigades that could do this job, except you know what? They haven't been doing this job. What have they been doing? They've been down in the West Bank, beating up 10-year-old boys, brutalizing 15-year-old girls, and shooting unarmed six-year-old men in the belly. That's what they've been doing for the past decade. They haven't been preparing for this kind of fighting. This kind of fighting is full-time job. You've got to be doing it all the time. They haven't. So even their regular, their 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 their, their active duty brigades, they can't do it. They don't have anybody who can do this. Their special forces can do this in limited fashion, but guess what? They're getting slaughtered as we speak. Sayyid Matkal has suffered around 20% casualties already. Same thing with their SEAL team, uh, the Flotilla 13 boys. They've taken heavy casualties. Shawl Dog, their Air Force commandos, heavy casualties. So they're, they're, the guys who are best at this are getting slaughtered before they've even gone in. And it's going to be up to the reservists. Now, let's talk about these reservists. Are they? Um, these are guys and gals who did their two plus years of service. They received their training, did their two years. Um, they've basically, um, you know, again, they got they got their basic training. They went into a unit, but again, what did this unit do for two for for the, the service? They were in the West Bank, or on Gaza, or they were beating up Palestinians. That's what they did. And it's demoralizing. These people joined the Israeli Defense Force. They're now in the West Bank. It is a horrible job they were asked to do. They are demoralized. So when they left the military, one, they didn't get any specialized training except beating up 10-year-old kids. Two, they're demoralized. Three, they're out and they're sort of happy. Now they've come back into a military that many of them have hard feelings for, and they're being told to commit suicide in Gaza. They aren't happy at all. So this is an army that's not ready for this job. This is why, even though the weather's okay, the Israelis are saying, ah, we got bad weather. We can't go in. Can't go in. Bad weather. Going to hold the operation. Can't go in. Joe Biden's here. They can't go in because they're not ready to go in. And the other problem is they mobilized 360,000. They put about 40,000 up by um, Lebanon uh, with Hezbollah. Understand that if they go into Gaza, there's a better than even chance that Hezbollah is going to come down south. Hezbollah has 100,000 highly trained men, people who have been eating raw meat for the last several years, uh, doing hard work, preparing for just this mission. You remember all those missions that the Israelis weren't preparing for because they're beating up Palestinians? Hamas has been preparing for it. They are prepared to seize northern Israel. 
This isn't just about firing rockets like last time. They are going to be attacking through, coming in, seizing towns. They may actually reach the Sea of Galilee. They will probably take the Golan Heights. Um, they will threaten Haifa. Uh, and Israel doesn't have an army that can stop them. They just don't have the forces to do it. So that's what's going to... So not only aren't they not going to win in Gaza, but if they start this losing battle in Gaza... Hezbollah is going to come down, and they can't stop that either. That's why there's a pause right now, because Israel's turning to America saying, what, what are you going to do to help us? And America said, two carrier battle groups and uh, 2,000 uh, Marine amphibious readiness group. Um, you think two, look, I'm a Marine. I love the Marines. Best fighters in the world. But there are limitations to what we can do. And I'll tell you right now that the 2,000 strong uh, amphibious ready group can't beat Hezbollah. Can't even come close to beating Hezbollah. They can't go into Gaza. They could do a, a, a non-combatant evacuation. They could do a limited scope um, hostage rescue, but not with 220 people down and, you know, 200 people down under the ground. You, you got to oh. add something to that, Scott. I was reading um, some articles that in Iran, like a million people are volunteering. The other issue you have is, yeah, there's that number of fighters there. If you started something like this, the danger is, and I would add maybe even the likelihood that people in the Muslim world see this as a war of civilizations and you have literally millions of people, literally those kind of numbers, there are people coming to the border, there are people trying to climb over the wall. So now you open up a situation where you have literally millions of people who Join. You know what I mean? It gets completely to a point where it's not a militarily manageable situation. It becomes a, they view it as a crusade. And um, I was reading, what is it, Malaysia, 260 million Muslims, and the entire, you know, um, nation is aflame, people screaming, get me there. The Afghans literally said, the Afghan leadership, the Taliban leadership said, if the Muslim leaders want to see, just want to watch a war, tell them, allow us safe passage to Israel and they can watch a war. That's the other part of the um, puzzle here that there's no solution for if it goes to that point. And then might I add, that's it for oil. No oil's coming out of the Middle East. The thing goes up in flames. Derivatives, everything crashes. You know what I mean? That's the other part of it, Scott. Yeah, look, you're you're, you're right. It, in, in Iran, first of all, Iran f uh, you know, raised the black flag over uh, over a shrine. And, and you know, people can go, well, that's just, guys, the Iranians take their religion very, very seriously. They raised the black flag. You know what happened after they raised the black flag? Two million Iranians signed up to go to war against Israel. They they went in and they signed up. They enlisted. They're ready to go. Uh, while this was happening in um, in Iraq, the pro-Iranian uh, Shia militias have sent forward reconnaissance elements to the Israeli border. So they've gone in. They said, okay, where's our sector of fire? Where's our operation? Boom. Okay, we're going to come in. They're preparing to move to the Israeli border. Israel has no clue what's about to happen. The fundamental, it's a fundamentally different kind of a uh, conflict. It, this is their worst nightmare. This is the Arab world coming up. And I saw something, and again, my wife tells me, never read the comments. But I saw something. Someone said that I forgot about nukes. No, you forgot about nukes. If anybody thinks Israel can use a nuclear weapon and survive, think again. It's the Samson option, guys. It means they use it, the house comes in, and it's end of Israel. Pakistan has already said that if Israeli missiles fly against Iran, Pakistani missiles fly against Israel. All right, now, if Israeli missiles with nuclear weapons fly against Iran, Pakistani missiles with nuclear weapons will fly against Israel. All right, that's just the way it is. The Muslim world is united. It's over for Israel. They've lost. They just haven't realized it yet. Their best bet is to try and find a way to get back to the Yitzhak Rabin solution, 1967 green lines. But if they want to fight, again, <laughs> fool around, find out. They're about to find out. Um, and the United States is about to find out. We don't have the military resources you know, deterrence requires, in order to be deterred, you have to believe that if somebody pulls the trigger, they're going to hurt you very, very badly. Iran is looking at saying, 
the U.S. can hit us, but they can't kill us short of nuclear weapons. And again, I don't think the United States is in the business of launching preemptive nuclear strikes against Iran because it will not end well. It won't end well uh, for the United States. Uh, the world will not forgive the United States a third preemptive use of nuclear uh, weapons. I, I got to add this. I read that a number of uh, militias in the um, in Iraq and other countries have said that if the United States enters on behalf of Israel, that all U.S. military bases become yeah. legitimate targets. So that's the other thing. You put ships there. Oh, yeah, they're deterrents, they're power, they're targets. You got hundreds of bases all over the Middle East. If the Muslim world sees this as a generational crusade war, you're not fighting a state actor anymore. How do those, they, you can't resupply the bases. You can't get those guys. Out. I mean, it, you're just, you're setting those guys in those bases up to, you know, they're in world of hurt. Go ahead, Scott. No, you're, you're absolutely correct. Look, we have several thousand troops in Syria. Again, the key to war, <laughs> it's not just about muscle bound men in the front lines with uh, cool looking weapons and, you know, cool gear. I mean, hell, we got the best TikTok army their world's ever seen. You know, we can dress up. We got the, uh, you know, I mean, God, we're good. Um, but all that is stuff. But the guy wearing the stuff, he needs to eat. First thing, where's the food coming from, ladies and gentlemen? Well, it's in the refrigerator over there. Huh? Where's the power coming from? From that generator over there. What power is the generator? That fuel and that fuel can over there. All right. You just named a number of things. One, we have to get the food to them and we have to get the fuel to the generator just to power up. And this is just the basics. You know, you go into combat with your basic load of ammunition, and it allows you to get into a nice little shootout. Uh, but eventually, you run out of ammunition, and you have to get ammo up. Where's it come from? Well, from that ammunition dump right there. But you don't want too big of an ammunition dump because that becomes a huge target. So it's a small one with the bigger one in the rear protected. But that means you got to bring ammo up from that, a line of communication, the same line of communication that your food and your fuel is coming in on and your replacements, because you can't do this for all forever. You've got to rotate out lengthy line of communication from Syria to basically Erbil in northern Iraq. It's where the you know, says a big base amongst the Kurds. But from that, a long road down through Iraq, through Baghdad. <laughs> down into southern Iraq, where a lot of Shia live, to Kuwait. Okay, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. If the Shia militias ever said, you're done, those lines of communication don't exist. Now, we can fly things into Erbil, but now this is Berlin airlift type and stuff, guys. We have to have dedicated transport doing this full time. And it becomes vulnerable because they're landing in an airfield that's going to be peppered with um, with rockets as they land. And once they blow up one C-17 or C-130, nothing's landing. Oop, you're out of logistics now. Um, we are so vulnerable right now. This is a horribly vulnerable. This is the worst nightmare for Americans. The best thing we could do right now is get everybody the hell out of Syria and out of Iraq. They are exposed. And everybody can sit here. It's all fun and games until they're over the perimeter, through the wire, and they're on you, and you don't have any ammunition. Then, then, it just, then you become a prisoner or you're dead. They will swamp us. They will overwhelm us. The Iranians have precision strike munitions, lots of them in close proximity. And when they decide to hit a specific bunker, a specific command and control spot, they will hit it. And we don't have a rap rapid reaction force to bail them out. We're pretty good until we run out of ammo. We're pretty good until we can't communicate. Air power can only loiter over a battlefield for so long before they have to leave station. They go bingo fuel. You, if you don't have other airplanes up ready to rock, but even those airplanes up ready, they run out of ammo. There's only so many bombs an airplane can carry. And when millions of people are coming at you, <laughs> you're going to get swamped. It's going to be over. It's going to be like a scene from, uh, what was that movie? Uh, uh, the Zombie Wars or whatever. Brad or, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or uh, if you think about it, think about the British fighting the uh, Zulu warriors. You know what I mean? The, the, you yeah, know, 15,000 British, they had guns, they had cannons. And the British and the Zulu warriors had a lot of very angry people. 
And, and they, they hit them and they're firing and they came around behind them and they came in from behind and they had these um the, these weapons. If you ever seen that studied that, they had like a big sharp kind of axe thing in the front and what have you. They had handheld weapons. They collapsed on them and they'd come in and they would gut you down the middle. You were done. You're not surviving that. And it was a matter of numbers. And they had two things. They had numbers, but they had a great Zulu general who had a great plan. When you run into the indigenous people with great numbers and a plan and they're angry, you ain't went, you're, you're, you're done. Yeah, it, it's it's over. I mean, it's the bottom line is, is that we don't have divisions in Iraq anymore. We don't have supporting arms in Iraq. We don't have the ability to surge a, a, a rapid reaction force backed up by meaningful power anymore. Uh, we have a certain number of guys up front that can do a certain limited mission. But if it ever got to the point where you are being challenged systemically by everything, everywhere, it's over. It's literally over. And it's going to be a bunch of little Alamos that aren't going to last very long. Uh, so, you know, this is the reality. We we keep talking about two aircraft carrier. I mean, I love how people are like, we got two aircraft carrier battle groups. Yep, there's a number of Tomahawk missiles. I get it. Um, number of aircraft. They can fly a number of sorties. You know, the last time we flew sorties over Lebanon, it didn't end so well. Do you guys remember that? Uh, the Zoof Mountains, uh, USS New Jersey, popping rounds off. Uh, they had old 16-inch cannons, so they didn't have the powder down right. So they thought they were hitting positions on the one side, but it went over the hills and hit the villages on the other side, getting everybody pissed off at us. So they came in and they blew up the Marine barracks. Um, but then we flew in the A6s to suppress the, uh, the the things, and they shot them down. And suddenly our prisoners, or we have pilots prisoners, again, didn't end well, guys. What do you think is going to happen? Let me just remind you, for all you, you know, veterans of uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, you, I mean, thank you for your service. But you're all sitting there going, we know war. You don't know Jack. You don't know squat. When was the last time you had, in Afghanistan, when you were in ambush and you're calling in, you had A-10s coming in and go, burp, on the ground. You know, <laughs> try and do that against an enemy that has integrated air defense. Try and do that against Hezbollah. They'll shoot you out of the sky. Try and loiter overhead. You know, we got we got we got planes stacked up. I'm a JTAC and I can call them in. Do that when the enemy can shoot down the airplanes and DF on your radio and blow you up before you get to communicate. We don't know war. You know who does know war? Hezbollah. They've been fighting it for a while against the Israelis who use the same technology and tactics that we do. A little war story from 2006. Sorry at Matkal is getting ready to go in and do an assault on a uh on a, on a village and they've, they've moved their position in and they're using the, uh, the, you know, this, this frequency hopping encrypted system uh, that, that, that the United States provided them. Frequency hopping means that even if you're trying to lock in on it, it's, it's hopping and using an algorithm and it splits it up and it's encrypted too. So even if you happen to get into it, you're not going to hear it. So they're in there. Well, the Iranians have been doing what Iranians do, ladies and gentlemen, listening to American radio frequencies in Afghanistan and Iraq and capturing them. And what they did is they were able to build a combat system. So when the Israelis turn on their radio, frequency hopping matches it. Then it decrypts real time. So they're listening to the conversation. And because they've been listening in to the Israelis, that unit, they had a Hebrew speaker who could match the accent, the lexicon, the speaking style. And so what happened is the Israelis were moving in and they knew that the code word to begin the assault was Apple. And so suddenly a Hebrew voice comes in that sounded an awful lot like the lieutenant, who they jammed, by the way, and they went, execute Apple. And, you know, this is Yoshi, execute Apple. And they went, oh, Yoshi said, execute Apple. And they went, boom, dead. Why? They walked into an ambush. That's how good these guys are. Stop treating them like little hill folk. Stop treating them like second-class warriors. You don't have to like them. You can hate them, but you better respect them. Because if you don't, they will kill you. This is the reality. Hezbollah and Hamas are that good. Now, we're good too, but we're not that good. 
you have to prepare to fight your enemy. This is like, you know, taking a, a soccer team. You can take, you know, Messi and you can Ronaldo and all these great soccer players out there. And these are some of the finest athletes in the world. And if you put somebody on a soccer pitch against them, they're going to sort of beat you up. But now you say, yeah, we're going to play a game, but it's called American football. And they're going to go, what? Yep, you got to come in. You got to play the NFL champions. We're not ready to do that. I'm sorry, that's the game you're playing. We're pretty good at what we do, but they play a different game. And unless we've been training for that game, it's not going to end up well. It's not going to end up well for Israel. It's not going to end up. The Iranians are very good. Hezbollah's very good. Hamas is very good. And we're okay. But again, we haven't been training for this stuff. We, we've not been preparing for this.